what a refreshing thing. Beautiful, just beautiful. Well, we have so much to be thankful for. Uh, today after the service, we're going to have a barbecue downstairs. So if you weren't prepared for that, we just want you to join us. Have uh, doesn't matter if you didn't bring a salad or whatever. That's okay. Um, yeah, the church is supplying the buns and the burgers and the hot dogs and the condiments and all that and the drinks. So just come on downstairs after the service and let's spend some time together just visiting with one another. That's awesome. Well, uh, as today is a special day that we've come back into the building um, after such a long time of, uh, of being outside and, and not being able to meet for a, a period of time, um, we're, we're really grateful to be here. And uh, I thought, what am I going to say, Lord? What is it that you want me to talk about this morning? And um, I think it's a good Sunday to talk about God's design for the church. Wouldn't you agree? It's a, it's a good send-off, a good start. It's good, it's good for us to look at what the Word of God has to say about the church. And when God created the world, um, he, he did so with a master plan. And, and in the earliest accounts of Scripture, we see... Um, from the time of Adam to the time of Noah, and then from Noah to Abraham, um, there were really no mention uh, in, in, that, in that time frame of religious gatherings. And the worship of God appears to be largely family-based, uh, with the father of the family as the priest and leader of the home into the worship of God. But um, then we see Moses come on the scene, and under Moses we see a transformation uh, where God... Uh, set apart a nation, the nation of Israel, to be God's ambassador nation to the world. And they were gathered together, uh, and the people, were God, uh, people of God were organized, and uh, they were set apart. And God gave Moses very specific instructions on how to organize the community of that day, and in particular, instructions of how to go about uh, worshiping him. And today, we live in... Uh, a democracy, but at that time um, in history, Israel was a theocracy uh, with God as their chief ruler. And the priests uh, were appointed to lead people into worship. The kings, judges, and prophets were ex ex executors of God's will over the people. So we see this was how it was established. The Israelites were faced with a struggle, though, we see throughout the Old Testament, the struggle that the, the nation of Israel had to stay on the straight and narrow. They struggled with sin. They struggled with going astray all the time. And everything in the Old Covenant showed basically how sinful humanity was and how unable they were to keep their course straight in themselves. And the Old Testament pointed forward to a time where there needed to be a Savior. We needed a Savior from our sin. And we know that uh, God purposed to, uh, to send the Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh. God in the flesh came to us because there was no other way for mankind to be saved. So Jesus was born and he came to us. God purposed that, the salvation plan, to establish a new covenant. You see, in the old covenant, there was worship established and, and, and services established around the temple. But it, there was they would go to to be ministered to by the priests, and the priests would minister to God. And it was now, under the new covenant, we have this relationship with God where God has moved the temple from the exterior into our hearts because of the precious work of our Lord Jesus Christ in dying on the cross for us. And today we're going to celebrate communion together as a celebration of, of what Jesus has done. But... Uh, in the Old Testament times, we see the majority of Israel, they, they rejected the Messiah. And as such, the ambassador nation, the Israelites were the ambassador nation. They were supposed to represent God to the world. The ambassador nation was set aside. And uh, we see uh, an age where God purposed to reach out to the entire world with his salvation through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, one day Israel, we know, is going to realize their great mistake. They're going to realize their mistake, and they're going to turn back to Jesus. But until that day comes, the world is in the age of the Gentiles, the age of the church. And we see a picture of God's unfolding plan in scriptures 
that tells us in the book of John chapter 1, verses 9 to 14 about the Lord Jesus saying, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, born not of a natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Praise the Lord. May God bless his word today. We are here. We are here today because of the work of salvation done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was the will of God the Father to extend his hand of grace and mercy to the entire world, and we're the beneficiaries of this decision. The organization of the people of God in this latter age of humanity is, in fact, the church. Now, we have a church building. We're going to talk a little bit about this. Okay, At Hillside, we are one of the local expressions of the university universal body of Christ, the church universal. The church is an institution, and it's ordained by God, but it's not an institution in the way that you would normally think of an institution. When I say institution, what do you guys think? Right? It sounds kind of cold, sounds kind of distant, sounds kind of uh, regimented to the point where it's just not a very nice place to be. And if you are there, you're there just strictly for business, right? Isn't that what comes up uh, when you think about an institution? Well, the church is not a typical institution in the way that you would normally think of an institution. The church is different. The church as an institution is more like a family than it is like uh, a business, right? I'm not the CEO of some corporation as a pastor. I am a shepherd. You are not just people that are members of an assembly. You're the family of God, and you're bound together. Uh, this is exciting. Uh, the church is a group of people called to be set apart to God for his purposes. What the Israelites uh, failed to, to see, we have in the church. You see, just as the Father sent his son, Jesus, to the world to save individuals, God the Father's purpose to us was to establish a, a kingdom of individuals who would care for one another, would work together for him with glad and sincere hearts. It's God's design that his church is to be busy engaging in his business of spreading the good news concerning salvation through Jesus to this world that is, is darkened in its understanding and is lost and needs a savior. And this is what the church was intended to be. It was intended to be a headquarters for God's people to go out and work with him, alongside of him. He's, oh, it's beautiful. God didn't have to do it this way, but he wants to involve us in his plan of spreading the good news out there to the other people who don't know. And, and, and he wants us to experience the joy of seeing people come to salvation in Christ, coming out of darkness into light. If you, if you weren't raised in a Christian family, and you're living without the light at all in your, in your home, and you came to know Jesus, okay? Just, just think for a moment back to the days before you knew Christ. Back. Remember how dark it was. Remember how different it was. And when God turns the lights on, right, that's what we want to see in this society is to see people getting the lights turned on where they see God for who he really is. Now, some people say that uh, they don't need the church to serve God. Have you ever heard that? I don't need church to serve God. I can just serve God on my own. I can just do my own thing. I got my Bible. I can just do, I, I'm a solo soldier, right? But this is not God's plan. You see, the church is the Father God's idea. Um, when people say that they don't need the church to serve God, in saying this, they're 
there appears to be a pivotal misunderstanding with some of God's plan for humanity. This misunderstanding, I, I believe, and when you hear this in, in, in our society, I believe it comes as a result of a cultural bias. You see, our culture has trained us to believe that faith exists solely for personal benefit. And this view uh, is, is just prolific across the board in our society. That faith, my faith exists just for my benefit, my personal benefit. This is man-centered uh, in, in that it, it's almost as if God actually exists to help make my life better. That's what God exists for. Um, and I'm convinced that our, our cultural setting has spoiled us with such a bountiful uh, uh, provision of possessions. And it, it's unparalleled in human history. We have so much at, at our disposal uh, we're nearly bursting at the seams. Even the very poorest of us are rich compared to other places. Uh, I mean, we have everything materially that we could ask for almost, right? I mean, most of us drive pretty decent vehicles, right? Most of us have pretty decent houses. And even those that are considered poverty-stricken still have vehicles. They still have houses. They still put food on the table. There are food banks in the town. W we do really well here, but all of this, all of this consumer uh, choice, okay, has uh, you add to that instantaneous gratification in, in the modern day, right? Now, I mean, we have instant coffee, instant, you know, fast food, microwave dinners, digital entertainment at the click of a button. Even the, you know, even. Uh, you know, or entertainment, you know, like if, if you have to wait, you know, five or ten minutes for something, it's like, oh, man. You know, it's like, well, a hundred years ago, you might have to wait days, right? Now it's like, oh, if I don't have what I want in five minutes, it's like. Well, this whole mentality, we're used to pursuing the American dream, I get Canadian dream, American dream, North American dream, driving nice vehicles, nice houses, Lots of comfort, creature comfort, plenty of toys and gadgets to entertain us, right? No, I'm not saying that enjoying things in life isn't a blessing from God. It, it is a blessing from God to be blessed in such a wonderful, uh, you know, way, in that way. But as long as we have balance about it, the secret I is to use what's given to us with wisdom. But there's an incredible danger lurking near us as a result of all this material prosperity and instantaneous gratification. There's a, a danger. The danger is that with all of our comforts, we become culturally acclimatized to having a self-centered me focus. Where faith, our faith crosses over to this, and it's all about me. It's all about what I need. It's all about what I can get out of it. You understand the, the mentality in our culture, how it shapes that, and how we can sometimes get caught in that trap and gravitate towards the same thing when it comes to faith. It's connoisseurs of Christianity. I mean, you can turn on the television, you can search the internet, and you can pretty much find anything you want as far as teachings and preachers and, you know, like, it's just everywhere. And I've heard Christian people tell me in the third world that they've come from the third world coming to Canada. They, they find it actually harder to maintain their spiritual equilibrium uh, here in Canada than they did back in the impoverished conditions of the country they came from. They find it very difficult to maintain their spiritual focus. You see, culturally, we're so often used to getting what we want in the material realm that the attitude transfers over to our view of God in the spiritual realm. We become this connoisseur of all things material and spiritual as well. The problem with this conditioning is that we're tempted to look at God and correspondingly the church as a consumer product at our fingertips given to make us better, more self-assured, more health, healthy, uh, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. Although I'm not saying that church doesn't help us be all those things, but that becomes the primary focus. Although the pursuit of God may start out as genuine, it's easy for the pursuit of God to become the pursuit of creature comforts. The focus on Jesus being our personal savior, personal healer, our portion, which is not a bad thing in itself, but if that's the sole focus and that's our pursuit, okay, 
it, it's almost like God becomes the cosmic Santa Claus in the sky. And if we don't shake the tree just right, and, and if he doesn't give us just what we want, we get disappointed. Oh, God, well, why couldn't you answer my prayer and give me what I want? God's going, because it's not good for you. What you really need is a dose of adversity. <laughs> what? Really? Yeah, because uh, you're depending too much on yourself and all your possessions and everything that you think you need, and you've forgotten about me. Really? That's okay. Okay, God. <sighs> okay. So, if we're not careful, the entire pursuit of God becomes all about me and what I can get out of the deal. This is where it falls short. This is where God's intended purpose for the church can fall short. God didn't intend his church to be a consumer place. God intended his church as something else. See, Psalm 24, 1 says this. The, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world, all who live in it. Everything is God's. That means nothing that I have is mine. My house, my car, my toys, my time, none of that is mine. It belongs to the Lord. It hi is his. King David, whom God called a man after his own heart, cried out in Psalm chapter 8, verse 4, What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You see, sometimes we get this overinflated view of who we are and an underinflated view of who God is. Oh, God, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, my friends. The fear of the Lord, that's a respect, understanding who he is. David goes on to proclaim in Psalm 50, 11, and 12, saying, For every animal in the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the creatures of the field are mine. This realm is not our realm. This realm belongs to God. He is the rightful owner of all things. Revelation 4, 9 to 11 gives us a proper perspective on a, the eternal God. The scripture paints us this marvelous scene in the throne room where the living creatures that Jehovah God created were worshiping him. And we see this throne room scene, and, and whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and, and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay down their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. And by your will they were created and they have their being. You see the power in that. You see the power in the throne room. You see that's the power of God. That's what God wants us to have while we walk our lives out here in the earth. That's the focus he wants us to have. A God-centered focus. Uh, what do you want me to do in honor of you to glorify you, God, with the life that you've given me? That's the kind of heart that God desires. That's the heart that he's calling his church to. So when we come into the attitude of these living creatures that we see in heaven and the elders, we see that our faith is not merely about our personal story. It's not just what we can get out of the deal. It's much bigger. It's about him. It's about his honor. It's about his glory. It's about his power, his pleasure, and the dominion that belongs to him and a collective reality that he has created that we are a part of and not the center of. May he increase as we decrease. May our cry be the same as that of John the Baptist, who said in John 30, 3.30, when he was speaking of Jesus, he must become greater, I must become less. You see, the true nature of Christianity is that our faith exists for collective service to bring God glory. It is God-centered in recognition that I was made to serve God's purposes and not the other way around. Man has always wanted to be God. That's the original sin in the garden. If you look back at the beginning, that was this big sin. Man desired to be like God, to have his own control, to have his own reigns over things. But faith does not exist for us personally alone. Okay? It exists for the glory of God. Yes, there's benefits to faith, absolutely. 
You become a believer, there's eternal life as a reward. There's hope that we have for eternity to come. That is a reward of the saints, but that's not the focus. That's not God's intention while we live out our lives. Otherwise, we might as well just hole up and go into a bunch of colonies and protect ourselves, right, from the outside world and just live for ourselves. That's not what God intended. Ephesians chapter 2, 12 and 13 reminds us, Remember at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. What a beautiful promise. So just think about the light getting switched on in your life. It can be easy to forget about what God's done in our past, right? We can, it kind of becomes hazy. Well, may God give you the grace to remember what it was like to come into the light again. Returning to your first love. God's purpose in creating us was to unite us to himself, to bring us into this loving relationship that starts out here and resonates into eternity. But he wants us to lose our natural self-centered perspective on things in this world and to get Jesus eternal eternal perspective centered instead for his pleasure we were created and for his pleasure he has brought us together as a as a church collectively the bible teaches us that as a church okay there's a couple of illustrations what we are like and i know i've said this a few times before in the past but i want to emphasize it again we are as a church likened to uh, a building. The building made for God to dwell in. Ephesians 2, 19, and 20, 19 to 22 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens, fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. What do you see in that scripture? Collective. It's a collective. We're joined together under Christ, or over Christ in this case, with him as the cornerstone, you know, providing the layout of the plan of the building and the apostles and prophets as the foundation layer. And we're built up on top of that. And what are we? We're collectively a place where God dwells. Collectively, individually, yeah, you're living stones. The Holy Spirit lives in you, but you're meant to be sewn into this body as a collective unit. That's God's intention. That's God's purpose. You see, we're living stones built on this solid and true foundation. Each one of us, if we believe in Jesus Christ and have accepted him as our Savior, and, and he has saved us from our sins and has cleansed us and has put his Holy Spirit inside of us, okay? You are part of this building. You fit into this building somewhere. If you've never had, you've never submitted your heart, your, your spirit to Jesus Christ, I would encourage you today to lay down your pride. Come to the Lord. Come before him and say, Jesus, I need you to save me. I need your spirit to guide me and give me strength, Lord. I, I can't do this alone. I need your saving power, Lord. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my life. Make me new. Okay? Make me new. Draw me close to you, God. When, when, if you pray that prayer, the Bible says if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. And when you're saved, you become part of this building, this collective, this building that rises to become a place where God dwells. Oh, wow. We're not our own, but we're interlinked and dependent upon one another in our lives and our mission, our, our giftings rest on one another. Our, they link to one another along with all the other saints that walk before us. And, and this is a more accurate description of the church than what typically comes to mind when our culture says or hears that someone says, I'm going to church, right? I'm going to church. It's like, the people are separated from this institution, from this building. What is his house? His house is the people. 
where he collectively dwells. It doesn't matter if we meet in this beautiful building that God's blessed us with, we meet in the field, or we meet downtown, or we meet in a house, it doesn't matter. The church is the people of God that are a collective building where he is praised and worshipped. As a church, uh, it says, and coming to him, in 1 Peter 2, 4, and coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, speaking of Jesus. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It all goes through Jesus. Our calling as Christians, yes, it is an individual calling, but it's not just an individual calling. Individual calling. 1 Corinthians 16, 6, 19. Do you not know that you are, your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. I want, I want to emphasize that again. You are not your own. That's what the scriptures say. My life, my time, my money, everything belongs to God. The question is, what kind of steward am I going to be when I, when, I, when I live my life out? When I reflect upon what God has given me to, to, to give in this world? Is it for him or is it for me? If I look at the scripture and I say I am not my own, it becomes about the collective church. We're powerful together when we stand together. We can encourage one another. <laughs> we can reach out into the community and into the world in a way that we could never do by ourselves. We need to join together. We need to be engaged. Every member of, the, of, the, of, God's, of God's body has a part to play. And this is, we're going to talk about that next. It's not only a building, but it's a body. The church, we're likened to God as a body under Christ's control. Christ being the head of the body, the church being the members, the, the other parts of the body. So Christ is the brains of the operation. He gives us the commanding instruction, right? And we go where he tells us to go. This is where we say it's, we're not our own. We're part of the body. We're part of God's body, the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink, the Holy Spirit, right? Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Christ the head, he's the brains, for Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 20 says this. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him. And I'm just going to pause there. All things were created through him and for him. All things, including you, including your family, including your life, were created for him. You are not your own. You were purchased with a price. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Wow, what a powerful. You, you, you can't get any better than that. I can't add to that, right? That, that is power right there. What I just read, that is the power of God for the salvation of this world, for the salvation of everyone who believes. <sighs> With Christ as the head, we're under his control. We're his body. Now, the foot, 1 Corinthians 12, 15 to 18. Some people say, oh, man, I don't have much to offer. I can't do anything. Well, yes, you can. There's something that God's created you to do. You might not recognize. You might not. Well, not, it, not every. I can't speak. Well, well, maybe you're not supposed to speak. You know, you're supposed to test, give your testimony and testify. But maybe you're not supposed to come up here and, and preach on Sunday morning doesn't mean you're any less important to the body of Christ. You have another function that's equally as important. And without you operating in that design that God gave you, okay, the body is crippled. It doesn't work 
according to the way that God desires. So as a local body, drill down through the universal body to the local body, if the membership, if only the tongues are working, if only the hands are working, uh, that cripples the, the mission. It really does, because everybody has a place to fit. The question is, where does God want me to plug in? Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not be, it, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. So, are you a hand? Are you a foot? If the ear says, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. God created you as a unique individual, and you fit into his big picture. That's beautiful, because if you serve the Lord in the way that he's intended you to do, it's glorious. It's in harmony with the Spirit. It's keeping in step with the Spirit, and you'll see the blessings of God in your life. You'll, you, you'll, you just, oh, you will. We're all accountable. A body is accountable to, to itself. Like, if I'm a hand, right? I can't, I can't say, yeah, uh, other hand, I'm going here. The other hand, no, I'm going here. Ah, right? How do we go? Foot, you go there. No, I want to go back here, you know. Ah, you know everything's got to work together. We've got to work together. We've got to communicate with one another. And how do, how do we communicate with one another? By listening to the head. And where does the word from the head come? It comes from the word of God, the Bible. The Bible shows us the, what, what the instructions are. Jesus has spoken to us through his word. And the spirit gives life to his word. And we wield the sword. The sword belongs to God, but we wield it in the advancing of his kingdom. Oh, man, I could go on about that. But Jesus, um, you see... A person cares for his or her own body, right? Right? I hope so. Okay? Sometimes my wife looks at me and says, you need to have a shower. <laughs> yeah, working all day, coming here, and you want to sit at the table. You stink. Have a shower. Right? My wife might say that. Okay? Well, we need to care for our body. We need to care for it. We need to clean. We need to care for the different parts, right? What does this say? As a body, collectively, if we're part of the body, we care for each other. We've got to care for each other. Because the head's telling us, okay, it's time for a shower. Yeah, it's time to trim your toenails. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying. Collectively, the hands grab the fingernail clippers and they trim the toenails. I'm just saying that this is a really good illustration about how we help one another to, to accomplish the mission that God has given us. Ah, you see, Jesus is the prime example of how he gave himself for the church, right? He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we were healed. We don't have... Uh, you see... I don't think we, we even grasp the depth of how powerful that is. He's the Lord of all creation. He speaks things into existence. The moon and the stars and everything out there is under his creative genius. And this, the God of all creation, came here and, and was pierced. He became a human being and allowed himself to feel pain. Why? So that you and I could be saved? Can, can we grasp that? Oh, I, I, I think sometimes we forget that. That he humbled himself so greatly. And you know what? Paul, <laughs> Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And he set an example for that. A and we also ought to love one another as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. We ought to give ourselves to one another. So that means sacrificially giving. When you see a need in the congregation, of believers. The question is, how do I go about meeting that need? How do I become a part of this solution? And I've been so pleased over the years with so many 
to see this collective thing. You know, one of the me- best memories I have in our church since I've been pastoring here now, I've been here almost six years now. But one of my greatest memories is our, uh, our little expedition to cut firewood. <laughs> yeah, we had trees falling in different places, and we almost had a truck hit, and God protected us and had grace upon our <laughs> things. But, but, you know, collectively, where we were all working together to supply some people's needs, that felt so good. Doesn't it feel good to do that? Oh, that's one of my gra- greatest memories. And that's how God created us. You see, he created us to serve one another, to help one another. This is the church. This is what the church is about. Ah, Romans 12, 1 to 2 lays out the blueprint for the church when he says this, when Paul says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. And further, Peter writes, 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. You see, we present our bodies as living sacrifices, as a spiritual form of worship. As a living sacrifice, okay. Sometimes we look at that as avoiding sin, as far as you know, bad stuff like don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, don't not you know the. And yes, it, it's in part. That's in part. That's in part what this is talking about. But offering your body as a living sacrifice to God is not just about avoidance of sin. It's doing the right things that he calls you to do. And that means being who you've been called to be as part of the body of Christ. You're really missing out if you're just warming a seat. It's time, church, for us to gather together, all our resources together, and to serve one another and shine the light out there in this dark world because they need the gospel They need what you and I have experienced coming into the light of Christ. They need it. They need it. And they don't need it 10 years from now. They need it now. Now is the day. The fields are white unto harvest. We just need to work together. Not all of us are going to be evangelists. There's some evangelists in our midst. But not all of us, we can all share our testimony. We can all work together. We can all support missions. We can all do things together for our community. This is all part of it. This is all part of offering our bodies a living sacrifice. That if you offer your bodies a living sacrifice, it means you have to give something up, right? You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have a functioning church and be on your own and be by yourself. You can't do it. It doesn't work that way. Ah, to respond to his love by loving and supporting and building up one another so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for one another. For if one part suffers, every part of it suffers. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. John 14, 34 to 35, Jesus said, A new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. So must you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. <sighs> Man. Love, love, love. Is that ever uh, all we ever talk about? Yeah, it is. Because everything that comes from the heart of God, even discipline, is out of a heart of love. You see, God wants us to be a testimony of His grace to the rest of the world. John 10:16. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The heart's cry of God is the same for this land as it was in the days of Israel with the Israelites. And as we see the New Testament church blossoming in Acts, it's the same heart of God today for us right here, right now. We have a blossoming uh, uh, potential right now. 
to step forward in faith and trust God with our resources, with our time, with our, our life, and to lay it before him and say, God, what, if I can't do anything but pray, then I need to pray. I need to be dedicated in that. I need to sacrifice other things so that I can do that. You see, this living our lives is a living sacrifice. Sacrifice, it means you give something up for something greater, <laughs> right? This is greater. Ah. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news? Church, Hillside Community Church, Church in Hundred Mile House, and those who are visitors here today. Second Corinthians 4, 1 to 6 clearly instructs, therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And that, my friends, connects to everything that I've been speaking about this morning. We turn our eyes to the master. We bow our knee to him. We obey him collectively. As a church, we interlock to become this temple for God to dwell in made of these spiritual stones. And we become a body, a body that is unified and knit together and works together for God's purpose. And it's all because of Jesus. Because he is the bread of life. He is the water that satisfies our thirst. John Chapter 635, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go th hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So today, we're going to come before the communion table. I'm just going to ask those that I've asked to help with communion this morning, if you would come forward. <coughs> 